While many of those in power have promised us nothing more than a dark winter, please keep in mind, and you'll see where I'm going with this, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. It's how you look at it, how you perceive it. In this case, one of those bright stars is research science in reference to nutritional therapy and susceptibility to pandemics. Now, the information that's being learned, in this case today we're going to review vitamin C and the Math Plus protocol, basically can not only help with this one particular crisis, or let's put it this way, challenge, but future challenges. For they are discovering that the correlation between malnutrition and disease susceptibility is far greater than physical distancing or masks. Very much so. Not only in reference to transmission, but severity and recovery. And with that in mind, let's get right into the research as follows. Now, the title can be a little deceptive in reference to this vitamin C. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you follow links and look at the full study yourself, primarily because this is a cornucopia, or I should say a pendium, of great, great research in reference to vitamin C in mitigation of a myriad of elements, even beyond that of COVID. So let us proceed as follows. First, before I forget, we're also going to cover the Math Plus protocol, as you see there, which has been updated as of November 3rd, 2020, which has an incredible, incredible combination of uh, basically recommendations for other medical professionals uh, in reference to nutritional therapy, as well as some descriptions, i.e. ivermectin. Remember, that's the first video ever censored by I from YouTube. I still have a sore spot of reference that ivermectin being censored because all we did was narrate the research from Melbourne University, but you'll see ivermectin on there. And you'll see a few other, uh, basically, hypothesis in reference to nutrition and other, again, pharmaceuticals for the benefit of the individual. But they're thinking. They're thinking outside the box. In this case, you have very, very, very innovative medical professionals, which are utilizing, if it doesn't hurt and can help, let's do it. So I'll proceed as follows. Vitamin C's effectiveness against COVID-19 may hinge on vitamins' natural transporter levels. Don't be deceived by the title. It's far more than that. High dose of vitamin C under study for treating COVID-19 may benefit some populations, but investigators exploring its potential in aging say key factors in effectiveness include levels of natural transporter needed to get the vitamin inside the cell. Many of those most at risk from COVID-19, including individuals who are older, black, male, and with chronic medical conditions such as osteoarthritis, hypertension, and diabetes, tend to have lower levels of vitamin C. Another reason vitamin C therapy would be considered a reasonable treatment, according to the researcher. The investigators also noted that patients may develop a vitamin C deficiency over the course of the COVID illness itself since during an inf active invest uh, investigation. Active infection, vitamin C is consumed at a more rapid rate. Now, I alluded to this in one of the data analysis uh, research last week. Think about this. One of the side effects, for example, of COVID-19, or should say symptoms, was loss of taste and loss of smell. Well, one of the nutrients that get depleted very rapidly is zinc as well. So basically what you're finding that COVID-19 will do is take these borderline individuals, nutritional-wise, and zap those levels to the point where, for example, what is zinc required for? Many of you remember, taste and smell. What is a symptom, again, this is publisher bias, but symptom of low zinc levels? loss of taste, loss of smell. So it'd be real interesting to see exactly in these COVID individuals which succumb to that and lose taste and smell what their zinc levels are. So let us proceed. It says insufficient levels can augment the damage done by an overzealous immune response. While not routinely done, routinely, forgive me, routine, 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 routinely done, there. Transporter expression can be measured today by using PCR technology, a method also used for novel coronavirus as well as influenza testing. While increasing transporter expression is not yet doable in humans, uh, one of the researchers' goals is to find a drug or other method to directly increase expression, which should improve the health of the older individuals as well as those with other medical conditions that compromise those levels. So keep in mind, what we are learning today in reference to pandemic susceptibility 
and nutrition is vital. A person can have plenty of food and still be malnourished if they're not getting the proper nutrients. And the best way probably today, based upon the correlations being made of future pandemics, instead of going around and around this cycle forever, is to improve the individual health of the population by making sure nutrient levels are adequately at par. Let's say, for example, nursing homes, why not? Basically make sure that if they take a, a nutrient uh, reinforcement drink, add vitamin D, zinc, and selenium. Very simple, very effective, according to the correlations, following Occam's razor, far more effective potentially of waiting for an experimental vaccine to come down the road when you have the tools to mitigate the damage now, but to proceed. What transport mechanisms the researcher is talking of is a reference here. Due to its water soluble nature, vit most vitamin C is absorbed across the intestinal lumen and transported across cellular membranes via sodium dependent vitamin C transporter 1 and 2, otherwise known as SVCT 1 and 2, depending upon tissue type. There's an alternative way that the vitamin can access the intracellular space, that being via glucose transporters, and the vitamin C has to uh, be uh, converted to a different form. I wonder about a scrumal palmitate being more of the fat soluble aspect of vitamin C, but still. Uh, that's a curiosity more than actually referring to the study itself. We are going to go to the full study, which again is everyone can have access to. And we are going to look at the one excerpt, but I encourage you to go beyond what I'm revealing for you today and look at the whole research itself. Again, the links in there will be, all be there for you. And so let's look at the viral response. And I'm going to read through this kind of fast, so please try to keep up. But forgive me, I'm not reading fast for any other reason due to time restraints. But to proceed, the underlying mechanism of cell signaling how vitamin C combats the virus infection still remains unclear, but the number of theories have been proposed. Currently, the rationale behind treatment with vitamin C is twofold, with the substance having both an antioxidant and immunomodulatory effects. Most viral infections are associated with decreasing levels of vitamin C below the normal 15 milligrams a liter because the intracellular environment undergoes substantial oxidative stress. Your body burns through vitamin C very rapidly when ill, sick, or flamed, or injured. This was illustrated by research by investigating vitamin C levels following herpes zoster infection. This is interesting. They found the patients who had been infected had an average serum vitamin C level of 4.6 milligrams a liter versus 13.5, seen in healthy individual cohorts. It is thought that the high-dose vitamin C therapy helps neutralize the pro-inflammatory response and combat the elevated levels of reactive oxygen species thus limiting collateral tissue damage that is often seen in viral infections. Also, as mentioned above, vitamin C is essential for a proper and effective innate and adaptive immune response to high concentrations of the vitamin being seen within leukocytes, lymphocytes and neutrophils. Furthermore, vitamin C has been noted to increase chemotaxis, if I pronounce that properly, please forgive me, enhance neutrophil phagocytic capacity and support lymphocyte proliferation. Lastly, it has been shown that vitamin C levels have an immunomodulatory properties in patients with viral infections due to its ability to stimulate alpha and beta interferons while simultaneously downregulating production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. It is clear that the literature that vitamin C indirectly reduces the viral load infection through its potent antioxidant properties and immunomodulatory effects. Here are all the current studies now going on in reference to vitamin C. That is a lot of individuals come into a very similar conclusion. So you have a nice subset of basically research of vitamin C in combination of certain medications, drugs, or treatments, uh, certain ways, whether it be oral, intravenous, so on and so forth, where the outcome in reference to vitamin C will be quite intriguing, especially look at all these registered trials going on currently. Let's go to the conclusion. Based on the literature mentioned above, high-dose intravenous vitamin C therapy has been shown to have a range of effectiveness from moderate to high in preventing and limiting the duration of viral infections, the most beneficial effect coming in those with reduced ascorbic acid levels. The vitamin C treatment is known for its beneficial role in preventing and neutralizing inflammatory response, reducing oxidative stress, and stimulating interferons and other antiviral cytokines. Vitamin C is, is uh, a drug of choice, again, nutrient of choice, drug of choice, one, the other, in this critical time because of its known high dose tolerability and little or no side effects. It is possible that vitamin C might help in certain populations of COVID-19 infected patients. The previous moderate success of vitamin C supplementation in human clinical studies may be due 
to several factors depending on the subject's age, race, level of vitamin C transport expression, as we discussed before, the GLUT, the SVCT, you know, and so on and so forth, uh, and polymorphism in the vitamin C transport, etc. Future clinical studies should be designed and conducted with all these factors taken into consideration, specifically vitamin C transport expression and polymorphism. We recommend that the factors mentioned above should be considered at the start of the clinical trial and during the anal analysis of the outcome of the clinical findings. It will be interesting to see if vitamin C can help specifically in treating COVID-19 infected patients who are older, have underlying conditions, or belong to the African American populations. I have never seen a virus uh, attack basically minority populations so aggressively. It is, it is I mean, if, if there is a weakness or an ailment, uh, it seems like the virus itself, whatever for whatever reason, is very aggressive especially those that have problems with vitamin D production, vitamin C transport levels, as mentioned in the study, and so on and so forth. I mean, if I had any, if I had any power involved in it whatsoever, the first thing I would have done, or would have liked to have done, is to basically just get as much nutrient uh, intake into those vulnerable populations as possible. In fact, I tried that. I tried actually contacting the health department the vitamin, and donating the vitamin D, C, selenium, to a lot of the migrant population out here, you can tell where that went. Nowhere. Now is the beginning, back in March. Uh, since then, uh, my suspicions, as well as suspicions of many other researchers, have been validated. But that's the number one thing I'd focus on more than anything else is nutrient intake and uptake to make those populations stronger, just not for this pandemic, but any future pandemics as time moves on. But to proceed as follows. Furthermore, there is an urgent need to investigate the direct relationship between serum plasma, vitamin C levels in COVID-19 infection rate and severity. All right. Beautiful study. I only want to narrate it through it. I don't want to add much more, more publisher bias than I already had due to other confounding factors that may play a role, which I did not think about. But I really, really encourage you not to take my word from the research, reading it or narrating it, but to actually look at it yourself so you can draw your own conclusions. Since many of you out there are basically either scientists medical students, medical researchers, or data uh, analytic specialists. But to proceed. Now, we are going to go to the math protocol, math plus protocol. Originally started out as the math plus protocol because, as you can read through here, it started basically as intravenous methylprednisone, high dose intravenous ascorbic acid, thiamine B1, low molecular weight heparin. And then the plus, the statin, the zinc, vitamin D, uh, I believe it's called hematine, famatidine, melatonin, magnesium. Think about this. That's how up to date they are. We just did the melatonin study just a couple of weeks ago, actually a week ago, and here it is, already in the Math Plus protocol. That is freaking innovation. So again, the link is going to be there, and here's an example of the protocol, prophylactic wise, and so on and so forth. Again, I recommend this is strictly for medical professionals, but still, it's information that all of us can benefit from because you look at basically the conclusion that a lot of scientists, medical professionals, so on and so forth, are coming in reference to basically how incredibly important a nutritionally sound individual is to combating the pandemic. You can put a mask on, you can distance, you can vaccinate, but still, that is not gonna offset nutrient deficiencies until people begin to take responsibility for that as well and improve their diets and henceforth their outcome. Right now, I'm not a fan of what's going on today because it seems like everything else has been going the other way. Indoors, out from the sun, you know, people are watering food online, so on and so forth. It took a lot of healthy behaviors that it took generations to basically establish in less than nine months, managed to unravel much of that. Again, in a perfect world, would have done things a little differently. And if I see black in my hand, please forgive me on that. Not that I don't wash my hands, but an ink cartridge exploded. This is what I could say. In any case, gratitude, thank you. Links will be there for you to follow. Again, on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday or Sunday morning, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, uh, we're gonna do a data analytic in reference to correlation of mask requirements and whether it actually made a difference in reference to hospital deaths and outcomes. I ran the first mass correlation in the United States between uh, mass level requirements up to mandatory. And again, it's kind of sketchy because of all the confounding in different states, so on and so forth. 
And I came up with a, a 0.39 correlation, which is fairly weak. Uh, maybe you could come up with a better way of doing the mathematics the maths for us. And again, we'll do that on Saturday night or Sunday morning. And uh, we'll do a few more uh, countries and so on and so forth and see if we can get maybe a Kendall Tau uh, analysis, a reference to that, to see if we can actually draw a relation to see if masks are actually doing anything or possibly contributing to it because moisture content builds up in cloth. And of course, this is a whole battle these days about spitting on each other. Also too, keep in mind, they are gonna start looking at animals such as cats and dogs. So that's why I really want to move this forward because where they're heading basically as far as restricting potentially contact with pets, I find how the humane and I don't want to see it go there. Again, gratitude, thank you. Uh, I'll see you all either Saturday or next week. And I hope you find this information in use. And as always, thank you for listening. Share as you like. And again, even if you want to take credit for the information, do it. All I'm doing is narrating it. You're more than welcome as long as we help somebody. All that matters. Catch you guys in a bit. Bye.